Again, welcome to Operating System CS332 class. And this lecture will cover chapter 10 of our course textbook. And again, we are going to focus on multiprocessor, multi-core, and also the real-time scheduling. In our previous lectures, which is again chap chapter nine, we discussed about uniprocessor scheduling. That's a computer system with one processor. So a multiprocessor means a, a computer system with two or more processors. So our main objective, again, is to cover the multiprocessor and also multi-core scheduling. Then our second part of the lectures for chapter 10, uh, we will discuss the real-time system uh, scheduling. So here, we're going to focus on the design issues, uh, process scheduling, thread scheduling, and also multi-core thread scheduling. Now, we know that when a computer system contains more than a single processor, then several new issues are introduced into the design of the scheduling function. So here we are going to begin with a brief overview of multiprocessors and then look at the rather different consideration when scheduling is done, both at process level and also at thread level. So normally we can classify multiprocessor system as following, uh, first loosely coupled or distributed multiprocessor or a cluster. Uh, this consists of a, a collection of relatively autonomous systems, which means again, each processor have its own mem mem memory and also have its own IO channels. We are going to address this type of conf configuration in chapter 16. Also, we have the functionally specialized processes. An example is an IO processor. So in this case, there is a master general purpose pro processor. Then we have specialized processes that are controlled by the master processor and provide services to it. The next is the tightly coupled multiprocessor, which consists of a, a set of processes that share a common main memory, and they are under the integrated control of an operating system. Now, a good way of categorizing multiprocessors and also placing them in a contest with other architectures is to consider the synchronization granularity or frequency of the synchronization between process in a system. So here we can again distinguish five categories of parallelism that differ in the degree of gran granularity. These are summarized again in this table here. So we have the gray size, uh, fine, medium, coarse, and very coarse, and independent. So five categories. And we have the description for each categories. And also the synchronization interval, which is the instructions. And we have uh, the level. So for example, with the gray size fine, the description is parallelism inherit in a single instruction screen, and it will be less than 20. Medium is para processing or multitasking within a single application, and somewhere between 20 to 200. And course is a multi-processing of concurrent processes in a multi-programming environment. Then we have a very coarse, which is distributed processing across network nodes to form a single computing environment. Mm -hmm. Then we have the independent, which is again, multiple unrelated process. So again, with the independent parallelism, there is no explicit synchronization among the processes. Each represents a separate 
independent application or job. So again, a typical use of this type of parallelism is in a time sharing system. So each user is performing a particular application such as word processing or using a spreadsheet. The multiprocessor provides the same service as a multi-program uni processor. Now, because more than one processor is available, average response time to the users will be shorter. Also, it is possible to achieve similar performance gain by providing, providing each user with a personal computer or workstation. Now, if any files or informations are to be shared, then the individual system must be hooked together into a uh, distributed system that is supported by a network. And this approach, again, as we said earlier, will be examined in chapter 16 in our, our course textbook. Again, in the other hand, a single multiprocessor share system in many instances is more cost effective than a distributed system. <clears throat> Allow economies of scale in DICs and other peripheries. <clears throat> so here we say no explicit synchronization among the process uh, with independent parallelism. Each represents a separate, again, independent application or job. So each user is performing a particular application and also the multiprocessor provide the same service as multi-programming unit processor. Now, because more than one process is available, average response time to the users will be shorter. Now with the coarse, uh, coarse and very coarse grain parallelism, yeah, we said that there is a synchronization among the process. There is a synchronization among the process, but at a very cross level. Again, this kind of situation is easily handled as a set of concurrent processes running on a multi-program uni processor and can be supported on the multi-processor with little or no change to user software. Also in general, any collection of concurrent processes that need to communicate or synchronize can benefit from the use of multi-processor architecture. Now in the case of a very infrequent interaction among process, a distributed system can provide a good support. Again, a very infrequent interaction among processes, then again, a distributed system can provide a very good support. However, if the interaction is somewhat more frequent, then the overhead of communication across the network may negate some of the potential speed up. So here we have to have a trade-off, a trade-off between the overhead and also about the communication issue. So in that case, the multiprocessor organization provides the most effective support. Then we have the medium grain parallelism. And actually we saw this in chapter four, that a single application can be effectively implemented as a collection of threads within a single process. Uh, when we cover again chapter four of our test book cover the threads. And again, sometimes we can have only a unit process or a single processor with multiple threads may do a more effective job than if we have a, a multi-processor system because of again, the overhead involved in the communication. Each processor may have its own resources, but with a thread, all the thread may share one resources of the processor. <clears throat> so in this case, the programmer must explicitly specify the potential parallelism of an application. 
typically there would need to be rather a high degree of coordination and also interaction among the threads of an application. This will be leading to a medium gray parallelism. So whereas the independent and very coarse and coerced grain parallelism can be supported on either a multi-program uniprocessor or multiprocessor with little or no impact on the schedule fashion, we still need to re-examine scheduling when dealing with the scheduling of threads. Because various threads of an application interact to so frequently and the scheduling decision concerning one thread may affect the performance of the entire application or even the entire process. The next is the fine grain parallelism, which represents a much more complex use of parallelism than is found in the use of threads. So although much work has been done on highly parallel, parallel application, this is so far a specialized and fragmented area with many different approaches. So next again, scheduling on a multiprocessor involve these three issues. So we have the assignment, the assignment of a process to processes, the use of multi-programming on individual processes, the actual dispatching of process. So it is important to keep in mind that the approach taken would depend in general on the degree of granularity of the application and also on the number of processes available. So schedule and multiprocessor involve these three interrelated issues. <clears throat> the first is the actual dispatching of a process, which would be the assignment of processes to process. Also the use of multiprogramming on individual processes and actual dispatching uh, assignment of process to process. <clears throat> so again, if we are assuming that the architecture of multiprocessor is uniform in the sense that no processor has a particular physical advantage with respect to access to main memory or to IO devices, then the simplest schedule approach is to treat the processor as a pool resource and assign the processes to processes on demand. The question then arises as whether the assignment should be dynamic or fixed or static. So static or dynamic means to be determined. Now, <clears throat> if a process is permanently assigned to one processor from activation until its completion, then a dedicated short-term queue is maintained for each processor. An advantage of this approach is that there may be less overhead in the scheduling function because the process assignment is made once and for all. Also the use of dedicated processes allow a strategy known as group or gunk scheduling as discussed earlier in our chapter nine Costes book. But again, a disadvantage of a fixed or static assignment is that one processor can be idle with an empty queue, while another processor has a backlog. So to prevent this situation, the common queue can be used. Also, all process go into one global queue and are scheduled to any available processes. So over the life of a process, the process may be executed on different processes at different times. Now in a tightly coupled shared memory architecture, the context information for all processes will be available to all processes. 
and therefore the cost of scheduling a process will be independent of the identity of the processor on which it is scheduled. Yet another option is dynamic load balancing, <clears throat> which is far better. So with the dynamic load balancing, in the, the trace are moved for a queue, the trace are moved for a queue for one processor to a queue for another processor. And normally the Linux system uses this approach. So as we said, the disadvantage of static assignment or fixed assignment is that one processor can be again idle with an empty queue while another process has a backlog. So to prevent this situation, a queue can be used, but the best option is dynamic load balancing, which again, we can move from one processor to another more easily. So regardless of whether processes are dedicated to processes, some means, to need, and some means needed to assign processes to processes. So two approaches have been used is the master slave and peer. So again, here, both dynamic and static methods require some way of assigning process to processes. So this approach, master, slave, and peer, and we will go through each one. So we start with the master slave architecture. And here with the master slave architecture, the key kernel function of operating system always run on a particular processor. The other process may only execute user programs and the master is responsible for scheduling jobs. Again, the master is responsible for scheduling jobs. And once again, a process is active, if the slave needs service, for example, IO call, it must send a request to the master and wait for the service to be performed. This approach is quite simple and requires later enhancement to a uniprocessor multi-programming operating system. And the conflict re uh, resolution is simplified because one processor has control of all the memory and IO resources. So there are two disadvantages to this approach. As we can see first, the failure of the master brings down the whole system. Since again, the master control the system. And secondly, the master can become a performance bottleneck. So the next one again is the PL architecture. Yeah, in the peer architecture, the kernel can execute on any processor. And each processor does what we call the self-scheduling from the pool of a variable process. So that's why it's called the peer. So each does their own self-scheduling. So in this case, the processor does the self-scheduling from the pool of a variable process. This approach, complicate the operating system. The operating system must ensure that two processes do not choose the same process. And also the processes are not somehow lost from the queue. So some techniques must be employed to resolve and also to synchronize competing claims to resources. And of course, of course, there's a spectrum of approaches between the two extremes. One approach is to provide a subset of processes dedicated to a kernel processing instead of just one. And also another approach is simply to manage the differences between the needs of kernel process and other processes on the basis of priority and execution history. So in most traditional multiprocessor system, processes are not dedicated to processes. Again, process are not dedicated to processes. 
Rather, there's a single queue for all processes. Or if some sort of priority scheme is used, then there are multiple queues based on priority and all feeding into a common pool of processes. In any case, again, we can view the system as being a multi-server queuing architecture. <clears throat> so for example, consider the case of a dual processor system in which each processor of a dual processor system has half the processing rate of a processor in a single processor system. In the case of run robin, which we discussed in our, we discussed run robin in our previous chapter nine algorithm, it is assumed that the term quantum is large comparing to context switching overhead and also small compared to mean service time. So the results again, depend on the variability that is seen in service time. So a common measure of a variability, again, will be the coefficient of variation, uh, which is C. So the figure here, again, figure here, compare run robin throughput to, again, first come, first serve, run robin is RR, and first come, first serve. Uh, we can see the difference in the diagram. And we should note that the difference in schedule algorithm is much smaller in the dual processor case. But with two processes, a single process with long service time is much less disruptive in the first come first serve case. Other process can use other processes. Also similar results are shown in figure one, 10.1b. You can see the single processor and dual processor and the difference. So in the general conclusion, the general conclusion is that the specific schedule discipline is much less important with two processes than with one. Also, it should be evident that this conclusion is even stronger as normal processes increase. So again, a simple FCFS discipline or the use of FCFS within a static priority scheme may suffice for a multiple processor system. <clears throat> So next we talk about the thread scheduling. So as we have seen again with threads, especially in chapter four, we thread, the concept of execution is separated from the rest of the definition of a process. An application can be implemented as a set of threads, which cooperate and execute concurrently in the same address space, because it's all the threads belong to the same process. So they all have the same resources and also the same address space. But on a unit processor, threads can be used as a program structuring aid and to overlap the IO with processing. Because of the minimal penalty in doing a thread switch comparing to doing a process switch, these benefits are realized with little cost. However, the full power of a thread becomes evident in a multiprocessor system. In this environment, threads can be used to exploit true parallelism in an application. Now, if the various threads of an application are simultaneously run on a separate processor, then dramatic gains in performance are possible. Now, approaches to thread scheduling. So among the many processor for multiprocessors, or among the many uh, proposes for multiprocessors thread scheduling and process assignment, 
four general approaches stand out. So these are the four general approaches. One is load sharing. So with the load sharing, again, processes are not assigned to a particular processor. So processes are not assigned to a particular processor. A global queue of a ready thread is maintained and each processor when idle will select a thread from the queue. So the term load sharing is used to distinguish this strategy from load balancing scheme in which again, the work is allocated on a more permanent basis. So process are not assigned to a particular processor. Now the second is the gang scheduling. So a gang scheduling here, we say a set of related threads is scheduled to run on a set of processes at the same time on a one-to-one -one basis and with dedicated processes assignment, this is the opposite of the load sharing approach. And it, prov it provides the implicit scheduling defined by the assignment of thread threads to processes. So each program for the duration of its execution is allocated a number of processes equal to the number of threads in the program. So when the program terminates, the processes return to the general pool for possible allocation to other pro program. And the last will be the dynamic scheduling. Here again, the number of thread in a process can be altered during the course of execution. So basically again, dynamic means changing. So let's go detail about each one. So in the load sharing, I would say is perhaps the simplest approach and the one that carries over most directly from uni process environments. So it has a several advantages here. First, we say the load is distributed evenly across the processes, assuring that no processor is idle while the work is available to do. Also, there's no centralized schedule required. So this means again, when a processor is available, the schedule routine of the operating system is run on that processor to select the next thread. So there's no centralized scheduler. Also the global queue can be organized and assessed using any of the scheme discussing again in chapter nine, which was the union processor scheduling. And this will be including uh, priority-based schemes and also schemes that consider execution history or anticipated processing demand. And here we're going to analyze three different versions of load sharing. The first scam, first serve, so with first come, first serve, we say when a job arrives, each of its thread is placed consecutively at the end of the share queue. So when the processor becomes idle, it picks the next ready thread, which it executes until we complete or completion or blocking. The next is the smallest number of thread first. So the shared ready queue is organized as a priority queue with the highest priority given to threads from jobs with the smallest number of unscheduled threads. So jobs of equal priority are ordered according to which job arrive first. That's if they have equal priority. And those who have higher priority will be in the queue first. They are going to be executed first. As with FCFS, a scheduled thread is run to compression or also blocking. And the last is the preemptive smallest number of thread first. So here the highest priority is given to jobs 
with the smallest number of unscheduled threats. An arriving job with a smaller number of threats than an executing job will preempt threat belonging to the scheduled jobs. Now, using simulation model, we can, in, the, in our course textbook, over a, a wide range of job characteristics, we may find out that, again, the FCFS is superior to the other two policies in the preceding list. Again, this was an example in our course textbook. So next is the disadvantage of load sharing. Uh, here we have the disadvantage as one, the first one, the central queue occupies a region of memory that must be accessed in a manner that enforces mutual exclusion. Very important. Again, the central queue occupies a region of memory that must access in a manner that enforce mutual exclusion. So it must become a bottleneck. If many processes look for work at the same time. And also when there's a, only a small number of processes, this is unlikely to be a noticeable program. However, when the multiprocessor consists of dozens or even hundreds of processes, the potential for bottleneck is real. The second advantage is again a disadvantage. So the second disadvantage is preemptive threats are unlikely to resume execution on the same processor. So if each processor is equipped with a local cache, then caching becomes less efficient. Also, if all threads are treated as a common pool of threads, it is unlikely that all of the threads of a program will gain access to processes or at the same time. Now, if a higher degree of coordination is required between the threads of a, of the, of a program, the processor switches involved may seriously compromise performance. Now, despite the potential disadvantages, load sharing is one of the most commonly used scheme in current multi-processor systems. So an example is that a thread of a particular application could be distributed among number of processes. With the proper addition software, this provides support for gang scheduling, which we're going to discuss next. So with the gang scheduling, the concept of scheduling a set of process simultaneously, simultaneously on a set of processes that predate the use of thread. And this is again referred to the concept as a group scheduling and cite the following benefits. So simultaneous scheduling of a thread that make up again a single process. And the benefit is again, if a processes in a group are related or coordinated in some function, synchronization blocking may be reduced and less process switching may be necessary and perform, performance will increase. Or a single scheduling decision will affect a number of processes and processes at this at one time reducing the scheduling overhead. So again, the term gang scheduling has been applied to the simultaneous scheduling of the threads that make up a single process. So gang scheduling is useful for medium gray to fine gray power applications where performance is severely degraded when any part of the application is not running. So 
So we have an example here. For example, we have unit scheduling and also we have the weighted scheduling. One thing also is that it's very beneficial for any power application, even one that is not quite so, uh, quite so performance sensitive. Now the need for gang schedule is widely recognized and implementation exists on, on a variety of multi-process operating system. Now the use of gang schedule creates a requirement for process allocation. So one possibility is the following. Suppose that we have N processes and M application, then each of which has N or fewer threads, then each application could be given one by M of a variable time on the N processes using what we call the time slicing. So uh, the example of a gang scheduling, so we have again processor in unit uniform scheduling, and this is a weighted scheduling. So next is the dedicated processor, again, assignment. And here we say that when application is scheduled, each of its thread is assigned to a processor that remains again dedicated to that thread until the application runs on compression. And also if a thread of application is blocked, waiting for IO or for synchronization with another thread, then that thread processor remains again idle. And in this case, there's no multi-programming of processes. And again, the defense of this strategy is in a highly parallel system with tens or hundreds of processes, uh, processor utilization is no longer so important as a metric for effectiveness or performance. So yeah, the total, the total avoidance of process switching during the lifetime of program, again, should result in a substantial speed off of the program. And we have the dynamic scheduling. Uh, so for some applications, it's possible to provide language and system tools that permit the number of threads in the process to be altered dynamically. So this will allow the operating system to adjust the load to improve utilization. Also, both the operating system and application are involved in making scheduling decisions. So next is the cache sharing. So we have the cooperative resources sharing and also resources uh, contentions. So here we see a multiple thread access this, the same set of main memory locations. So example will be application that are multi-threaded. Uh, we may have a producer consumer thread interaction. And a thread, if operating on the adjacent calls compete for cache memory location. So if more of a cache is dynamically allocated to one thread, again, competing thread necessarily have less cache space available and thus will suffer performance degradation. So again, the objective of contention is a well scheduling is to allocate thread to a cause to maximize the effectiveness of shared cache memory, and also to minimize the need for of cheap memory access. And that will be the conclusion of our lecture. The again, the first part of uh, chapter 10, which again cover the multi-processing and multi-core scheduling. Uh, one thing also we should know that if there's a uh, hydro processes, use them 
to satisfy the request. Otherwise, if the job marking, making the request is a new arrival, then we should allocate it a single processor or take away from any job currently allocated more than one processor. So again, there are at least two different aspects of cache sharing to take, a, to take into account. As we said again, we have the cooperative resources sharing and also resources contention. Now, again, with co uh, cooperative resources sharing, multiple thread access the same set of memory, main memory location. Example are the applications that are multi-threaded and also, as we said, the producer consumer thread interaction. Now in both cases, data brought into a cache by one thread need to be accessed by a cooperative thread. So for this case, it is desirable to schedule co cooperative thread on adjacent calls. Again, the other case is when threads, if operating on adjacent calls, compete for cache memory locations. Now, whatever techniques is used for cache replacement, such as least recently used, uh, which will represent as LRU algorithm, if more of a cache is dynamically allocated to one thread, then the competing thread necessarily has less cache space available, and thus it will suffer performance degradation. So again, the design of algorithm for this purpose is in an area of ongoing research and is subject of some complexity. So this again, area is beyond, uh, uh, I would say beyond our scope and also the textbook uh, don't go in detail about cache sharing. So again, wish everybody the best and hopefully we will see in our next lectures and the second part of chapter 10 uh, will be the real-time system scheduling. Again, thank you for your time.